Yeah, Folks, welcome to Moe's Alley, and uh, we're joined by an iconic musician. The guy was just playing the electric bass like an upright bass. Well, old anyway. I yeah, I mean, he's been all around this world. Pete Sears, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show, brother. How you doing? Can you talk about, was John Cipollina the first cat to take you, I don't want to say under your wing, but I mean, when did you connect no. with John when you got, when you got to the States? Um... Uh, well, I, I, the first, John came later, you know. That Did he? Wasn't, wasn't the first. Of the, you mean the first time in the States? You mean well, because, I, because, I, because I went, I'm, I'm I trying, went to, through I'm the trying to square the circle I, of I when went, you came from, from England yeah. and, and when Cipollina came. I mean, Johnny's been a, yeah. a, a spirit on my journey. Yes, of course. So just riff on Johnny or, you know, whatever you want. It looks close to me. Well, okay, I started out um, playing music in, 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 the, in England, in the United Kingdom all over the British Isles, playing six or seven nights a week back in 1965. Okay, and, and recorded on uh, EMI in Columbia Atlantic, uh, Abbey Road. It was EMI Studios back then. What was the name of the band that you were? And, uh, Sons of Fred. Oh. And we went on TV and did all that. I was, you know, 16 years old, right? Unbelievable. It was. Anyway, so then we went through a series of different bands, you know, and I did some work with Rod Stewart. And, but, but finally, in 1969, I met Lee Stevens who, in London. He was he was from uh, California, and uh, he was in a band called Blue Cheer, original guitar player. And uh, he was trying to distance himself from that, you know. And he was in London recording an album. And Mickey Waller from the Jeff Beck band, the drummer, a friend of mine, introduced me to him. And, he, and Lee said, "If you're ever in the States, look me up, and we'll we'll do something." Right. So uh, and he gave me a little scrap of paper. The diagram of Santa Monica Pier, Arrow, merry-go-round, and that was it. No phone in, in England. And six months uh, <laughs> and six months later, I managed to get the money together, and I, I just showed up. I flew to, for the first time, to the U.S. 21 years old, 1969, and uh, and just fortunately he still lived there. And so I lived in Venice Beach, and then above the merry-go-round in Santa Monica. So you were in SoCal before Mill Valley. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was there. And we had a band called Silver Meter with Mickey Waller from the Jeff Beck Band. And, uh, we, and Lee, and we just did all this um, kind of, I don't know, just he heavy, you know, sort of jam, trio, rock kind of stuff. Made an album, went to Bachelor of England, did an album. And after that band, I joined Stone Ground. I was with those guys. And how did recorded you record an album? They were Bay Area band. Yeah. And so how did you? Well, no, they, they they formed on the Medicine Ball Caravan, which was uh, big, wavy. Yeah, going across America, the hog farm, and then they came to England, and I just the Silver Meter had just broken up, so Tom Donahue, their uh, uh, manager, yeah, uh, asked me to join on bass, so I joined them in in England. I was back in England at that point, and then then I came back. Then we recorded there at Trident Studios, and then with uh, Bob Matthews and Betty Cantor and then we came back and recorded another album which was released and then I think we played at the Dead show that New Year's Eve and, and it was so we were renting a house in Mill Valley and that's when I met John in 1970. 1970 I met John Cipollina and then we, we said let's, we talked about getting a band together and that's a year and he took me down and meet Jerry, meet Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir and and we did our um, uh, we did a KSAN live broadcast. It's an epic. It's an epic. It, it, it's, it's still. It's still. It was in the record library. Not, not, you know, not the fancy ones when they started going to the record <laughs> plant. So it's, it's a Richard Gossett show. Just the record library. Lots of dead air space and people quipping and Jerry talking and and I played the old upright piano in the corner. But after that, I went back to uh, record. Um, uh, Every Picture Tells a Story, piano with uh, Rod Stewart. And then came back to America with the Long John Baldry Blues Band to tour, his first couple of tours. And uh, and then talked to Jerry, you know, and he asked me to play on his uh, first solo album, but I was on the road. I couldn't do it. It was kind of a shame. He wanted you to play bass? Yeah, I wanted to play piano. Or play piano? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played piano with Rod Stewart, and I played piano at this jam, you know. 
uh, Mario Cipollini. Replied. Would you would you yes. say that you were so as we, you know, a, so it was a while we, before I got to jo- got to meet John, but then we then we I left that band and formed Copper. 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 No, we'll get into that. I, I one thing I wanted to ask you about McLaughlin. Uh, I just interviewed Alex Litcherwood down in Southern California. Um, Brian Auger. Um, I wanted to ask you. I mean, were you? Somebody who just was self-taught. Were you a skip? Were you playing skiffle music? I mean, when you first started, before the tablas came and the sophisticated jam came, would yeah. you say that you were an organic <clears throat> street scholar? I I, uh, I started out as a kid, you know, playing. Uh, I mean, lo- piano lessons, right? Like most kids. Classical stuff. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know, I had a really nice teacher. I weed her garden. <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she, she gave, and we got as far as uh, you know, for Elise and Blue Danube. And I, I was reading a bit, you know, and then uh, then I, I heard o- Otis Span, ah. and um, my brother used to listen to Brubeck, so I, I love to listen to that. And um, yeah, project project your voice. People want to hear. <coughs> people love so, it. So yeah, my so my, bro- my bro- older brother was had, was listening to good stuff, you know, Jimmy Reed, and and I had a, a, a my brother's. Friend had a um, his, his, his step brother had a, um, a shop in Bromley, Kent, where, and I uh, had all the old folkways, Big Bill Bruins, he led early, uh, in those old uh, blues albums. So I was listening to all that stuff, you know, and it was like that all over the British Isles. Really, there were blues clubs, and we just we listened to those guys, and we just loved it, you know. And, uh, so anyway, then I, then my, I was in a semi-pro band, that stuff, Spitfires, in uh, Biggin Hill, and uh, and then then I, then they turned pro with the band called the Sons of Fred, and then went all over the British Isles, had a record contract, 16 years old, went on the road, beat up bands, you know, it's a great way to, you know, to get a, to get used to doing this sort of thing. But you, but. I'm just trying to get it. When I watch you on Soundcheck, your your time feel is great, and I'm just trying to figure out how you developed your own internal time feel. Well, that was just kind of um, playing a lot. That's all. And playing, playing with a lot, playing a lot, and playing with some really good drummers. Who who like can you like some English on on Harold? Yeah, well, Ansley Dunbar, you know, and then oh, that's uh, right, uh, Ansley. And you John played. Ling, uh, John John Lingwood from Manfred Mann. He was, he was a great. Player too. We and Heisman, he, maybe. He and I played together. Uh, I, I, I. John Heisman. I, I rehearsed with those guys for for a bit. I think, but I, I didn't do any live shows with them. Pete Brown was a good friend of mine. And, um, but then of course you know jo, uh, um, Johnny Barbada was with, with Jefferson Starship from '74. To, Barbada, you know, man. Yeah, he was great. Oh uh, man. But, uh, and. Um, uh, Donnie Baldwin's great, you know, Prairie Prince, I mean, just so many great drummers, and, and uh, you know, John Molo, who I play with now, a fantastic drummer. Uh, you know, um, so many, so many, so many great drummers, Jimmy Sanchez, I don't know, but they, they help my, you know, help me by playing with those guys. And, but really, it just goes in, you know, bass is a concept, it's, it's um, you know, in the 90, a lot of guitar players think they can pick a bass up and just play, and technically they can. But knowing when to play and when not to play, that's the important thing. And if you know how to play busy, knowing when not to play busy and when to play busy, it's what, very important. No, it's, it's <laughs> if, I mean, you also, were, do you feel like you still, even with, with uh, the Greenleaf Rustlers or going back to uh, any of the bands, you play the bass counterpoint to the vocals? At some point, that oh, disappeared. That, yeah. that, that, that that was so burning. You listen to the, the Motown stuff, yeah. and, and and music got away from that. But do you still? I mean, do you still make a conscious effort oh, to play counterpoint God. to the vocals? Well, no, I mean, I don't make. A, you know, I actually, it's all just coming out. This point. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't, not a single, a single song that I work something out on. You know, I'm, I just make sure I try to remember which chords are coming, and you know, I'll have a cheat sheet maybe with just chords. What I do around that is always a little, little different every time, and I just kind of go for it. But the uh, I've played so many, been so many different kinds of bands, played so many different kinds of music, and I've, I've never really studied the bass. You know, just uh, it's, it's, it's all feel picked up live, playing live and listening to 
uh, when I started out listening to Doug Dunn and you know Jamie Jameson and all these great players, you know, and I just, um, I, I, you know, I mean, not that I could ever play like them, but I mean, I, old school stuff. You know, one one cat who's tuning in right now, uh, and I wanted you to talk. He's a dear friend of the program. He's been a huge support of mine. Is uh, and I saw this YouTube video of you and Neil Schoen and him. Is Greg Rico? Oh yeah, yeah. When did you When did you connect with a? When did you? I mean, he was obviously with Sly, but I mean, you were immediately yeah. embraced by all the cats from uh, from the Bay Area. Well, I just um, you know I label in music just one thing leads to another. Really, uh, I met met Greg and, <clears throat> and Neil and. And we just decided to form this band. It was just a, a no vocalist. We didn't have a vocalist. I was at Greg's house. He he just left with sl playing with Sly Stone, and and uh, uh, Neil with Carlos who was in Dino. Just right. finished up with that. So it was Diamond got, Head we Crater. Got, we, was the most burning thing ever. We went to the Diamond Head Crater Festival and, cut, and some other gigs in the Bay Area, but the Diamond Head Crater Festival. Uh, we did it was almost entirely instrumental except for two songs when Greg Rowley came up and sang Black Magic Woman and I forgot what the other tune was they're the only two vocals on, on that whole um, that show and the band was mostly just instrumental when we were looking for a vocalist and I, was, I, I was trying to get a hold of Stevie Wimbledon on, from a pay phone at one point but I couldn't <laughs> <laughs> just to see if he wouldn't have done it anyway um, anyway, yeah, but it was, a, you know, it had some moments. We, we did a kind of a Hendrixy cream kind of concept. It was, it was beyond, you know, it was burning. And, and it was burning stuff. I just, mean, just bay. I, I love, that's one of the most fun things to do on bass for me is to play in the, in the trio format. Because it, it, sonically, you're, you're, you're let loose to play, to, to go anywhere, really. Well, that's what within I, reason. you know, listen, you're not the, tied down. I mean, let me ask you a question. That, uh, I've, I've talked to Stanley Clark about this. I've asked recently Ron Carter about this. And I want to ask you about how responsible rhythm sections are for creating new musical vocabulary, like to expand musical vocabulary. Are they, are they the drivers of it, or are they only a conduit for the rest of the band? Well, the, the ideal situation is when uh, nobody is leading and everybody is just reacting. That's it. You know, they're the ideal situations. Uh, and for me, anyway, and um, you have arrangements, and then you go off into the ether from that arrangement, and everybody <laughs> goes together. You hope you don't always. It doesn't. Not every doesn't work every time, but you have to live a little dangerously. So that's where the uh, I think uh, experience, you know, and having some technique helps because and and playing with drums, drummers, and everything, I mean. You, you get to know instinctively where they're going and where each other are going. It's like a school of fish moving together at the best time, and it's a, it's a really spiritual feeling. All the experience with, with the audience is feeding the band. The band is feeding the audience. Every, it's cyclical, and you know, everything is just going. When that happens, which isn't all the time, it, it can lift the roof off the place. I mean, that's when spiritual. That's when the, the band is going. So, the base, basically, like, to answer your question, I mean, of course, I think. Um, there's plenty of good music that doesn't it doesn't have bass and drums in, uh, but uh, um, but when they're there, it, it's very important. You know, it's, a, it's an important part of that. If, if the music needs drums and bass, or just bass, or just drums. It, uh, but going back to the folkways stuff that you that you immersed yourself in, did you play a lot without a trap drummer for a while? For a while. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean. Um, I was just listening to that stuff. Uh, I actually, for some reason, uh, we, we uh, almost always had a drummer at that point. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. No, but yeah. I mean, like, yeah. you, like, I mean, but, but you know, I, you were talking about influences. I mean, um, I have to say, Ray Brown. Uh, there was a record. Uh, I think it was Barney Castle and Shelley Mann and Ray Brown exploring the scene, maybe. And Ray Whoa, Brown. Well, I mean, that's Ray uh, Brown's bass playing and that. I mean, he's, you know, I'm. Um, just unbelievable upright bass, just incredible. So that's that was an amazing. Well, I mean, this is not stuff I sat down and studied because I, I didn't have the, the, bit of the facilities to do that. I was on the road all the time, playing rock and roll, broke half the time at that point. But uh, but you know, it all it kind of goes in subliminally. And, uh, and Ray Brown, what an amazing player he was. But also when I was. Uh, 
around 15 years old, a friend of mine took me, he said, you gotta check this out. And we were in the front row of a concert near Victoria Station in London. The curtain, uh, curtains opened up and there's the Duke Ellington Orchestra, 1964 Duke Ellington Orchestra. The full orchestra. I'm sitting there with my, from South, you know, from South London, kid from South London. I mean, it was just um, you know. What what was uh, what, what it was it? Absolutely it? blew my mind. I mean, Kent Anderson came out and did Summertime. I, it was a spiritual experience for me. You uh, was it the vibe too? I mean, the vibe yeah, that heaven about it. It's just, just all the colors, and visually, and the vibe and the music. Um, I mean, I, I didn't go. I did not go into a career in jazz, but jazz has always been an influence in my music. Everything that playing. you play is inflected with jazz. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't. I would never call myself a jazz player, of course. Uh, and I, I don't know what to call it. I think rock and roll is a good, a safe place to say. It's a good. You know, it covers a lot of ground. I mean, but aside, Greenleaf Rustlers, we're, we're competing against uh, some uh, some ambient music right now. But what what other gigs you got going on? First of all, somebody just chimed in and said, uh, "Yeah, you're playing with uh, Terry Dolan was transcendent as well." But what 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 other what other amalgamations are you uh, are you uh, are you in right now? Uh, well, there's uh, uh, there's a band called uh, California Kind. Other than the Greenleaf Rustlers. Yeah, California Kime, and that's what um, uh, Rob Watson, and, uh, not Rob Watson, uh, somebody, somebody's, somebody was uh, not Watson. Uh, looking over your shoulder there for a minute. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, and uh, Rob Baraka, I'm sorry. from Rob Baraka. Yeah, he's on, on keys, and I'm playing bass with that band. Uh, and Katie Skeen on Sly Guitar, she's great. And, uh, and, um, and Barry Sless, John Lola. And we have a, and then the David Nelson band, when he, he's, Moon Alice. he's not well right now. And then we play with, of course, with Moon Alice is the main band I'm with right now. And also play some piano with Harvey Mandel. I uh, just played on his new album and got a gig coming up with him, a uh, blues gig festival in Sacramento. Uh, so I like to keep my hand in that stuff as much as possible. Oh, anyway, yeah. it's, it's a bunch of different bands. <laughs> You, I mean, all, more than I expected at my age. I guess all, all I would love, my only request tonight is uh, that um, you and Molo break up time and form as much as possible. Yeah, well, this uh, this particular band doesn't have a lot of, you know, as much improvisational bits as maybe some of the other bands I play with. But uh, there, are, there may be some in there. Pete like, Sears. It's kind of playing, yeah. Yeah, man. I'm, listen, we're going to get your personal account back up online, but it, what an honor to talk to you, man. I can't wait to burn tonight, man. All right. Thanks a lot. Much love to you, man.